God is on the move. It's exciting to be part of it for sure. All right, so um, just the disclaimer for today, if you missed it last week, we're going to be talking about what it means to follow Jesus, to be a Christian. Now, in some of our minds and some of, uh, you know, the, the press that's out there about being a Christian is not, you know, people following Jesus or people behaving Christ-like. Right? You can agree that there's a lot of people who have the name, you know, Christian as part of their descriptor of themselves, and you're like, yeah, that doesn't look a lot like Jesus, though, all right? So, so what we want to do is we want to, like, get rid of some of the negative things, because I'm going to be using the word Christian a lot, because it's easier to say than Jesus follower or student of the gospel. It's easier just to sum it up. I'm going to go a little old school, right? And just call us like Christians. And so um, think about little Christ, people who are following Jesus. So last week we talked about what does it mean to follow Jesus? How do we do that? And it's the A, B, C, and D. Admit, first of all, that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and a Lord. Somebody not just to save you, but somebody to be in charge of your life. Because we're going to mess it up every time, right? Yes, amen. Can I get an amen? Okay, thank you. Need a little talk back. All right, but that can be really, really hard for the average American to admit that they need help or admit even to raise your hand when I say, who needs prayer? It's really hard for us to say like, yeah, I actually need somebody to help me out. Okay, Uh, the second one, so after admit you need a Savior and Lord, it's to believe that Jesus is the guy to do the job of dying for your sins and rising again on the third day to show he has authority over sin. So admit it, then believe it. And then the third thing is, and this is kind of overlooked, because we're like just waiting for the altar call. We'll get a bunch of people up here and make them admit and believe, and then we'll just send them out. No, there needs to be a counting of the cost of following Christ. Because being a Christian in any century, including your own, has never been a walk in the park. I mean, there's times that Christianity has kind of bloomed in the United States or has bloomed in other parts of the world. But as a rule, it is like not a blind faith that we are taking a step. We have to count the cost of what it means to live for Jesus. Say, yes, you're my Savior and Lord. I'm no longer in charge. I surrender to you. And then the fourth thing... A, B, C, D, yes. Fourth thing is do something about it. Do something to prove that you are following Jesus. You join a Christian community. doesn't have to meet on Sunday mornings. You read your Bible every day. You spend time quietly in the presence of God. You invite the Holy Spirit in. And God is so good to us that when we take one step towards Him, He's already there to meet us. He's just waiting for you to say, okay, I surrender. But how low and how hard do things have to get before we actually, right, say, okay, I've counted the cost and what I'm doing right now is not working. So I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to get right with my faith. Um, Last week, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or if you made a recommitment to the Lord, um, I want you to not just tell someone, I want you to tell me because we want to celebrate with you and then take next steps. The next step after doing the A, B, C, and D, part of that do something is making the public profession of your faith. That is getting baptized. That is um, walking in accountability with other people and other believers. And nobody's going to shame you, even if you're like 80 years old and you're just now realizing what God has offered you. So just so you know, there's, we are here for you. Yes. All right. So if I asked you, now we're moving on to the next thing about follow Jesus. If I asked you right now, can you name one person who cares about you? Amanda. Yeah, Amanda. <laughs> Amanda cares about everybody. She's my person too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so can you name one person who cares about you? Yeah, I can. I can probably name like, you know, 50 people who care about me most days. Right, church? Amen. What, what? Okay. <laughs> Brian's laughing. Um, I am feeling my oats today. All right. So <laughs> the manna from heaven, right? Bread of angels. Okay. Where was I? All right. Name one person. You can. You could probably name a handful of people. And how can you be sure that they care about you? It's in their words. I love you. I like you. Yep. How they make you feel when you're around them. 
Um, even like uh, um, just nonverbal, like nonverbal communication, right? Like, um, you know, doing the dishes for you or, or cooking you dinner or inviting you out to coffee or just saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. There's verbal and then there's also nonverbal ways. Okay, is it good if we care about somebody to keep it private or quiet? No. Like, you've been married for how many years now, Jason and Kat? Seven years. Okay, it doesn't work if he never tells you that he cares about you or shows it, right? Right, and vice versa. Like, you'd be like, I love you, babe, and then she just, like, ignores you all the time. No, you can be sure, and you want to be sure about how you care about each other. So what I'm saying is, is that there are things that God wants us to be sure of and certain of, certain of. Like, these are not, like, great mysteries that we have to explore our whole lives. And yet sometimes we're sitting in this darkness, like, does God really care about me? I don't, I don't know. How can I be sure? So today we're going to talk about how can I be sure that I am a Christian, because some of us in here, we might say, like, we, you know, we might have been following Jesus for a really long time, and you're just gotten into a routine, you kind of got stuck in a rut, and you're like, can I really be sure that I am a Christian? And so John Stott's little book about becoming a disciple of Jesus that I've been referencing for this series, he says that the assurance of our faith is a three-legged stool. Like, they have to have all three things in place for us to be sure about our Christian walk. Like, can you be sure? Yes. And it takes these three things. I'm sure there's other three things that other people would say, but John Stott's my guy, theologian, you know, author of this book that just spoke to me. So, um, but uh, the three assurance of our faith. So the first one, the first assurance is the finished work of the cross. The finished work of the cross is our first assurance that we can believe that, that God is for us and that our salvation is secure. The finished work of the cross. I love this time of year because that's what we get to talk about the most is Jesus' journey to the cross and then Jesus' journey of resurrection and then the disciples as they start following after him and are filled up with the Holy Spirit. So turn with me. I know this is going to be great. I'm saving the other um, scripture for another time, but turn with me to the last book of the Bible, to Revelation. And I didn't bookmark any of my, my things, so you might beat me there, my scriptures. I usually go through and spend time bookmarking. I didn't do that. So I'm like, I'm still going to win because I'm super competitive. <laughs> All right, Revelation um, 21, verse 6. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, although a lot of translations are really great. This is just the one easiest for me to read. Um, okay, so the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. At the end of all times, he will say, it is finished. What he doesn't say is, I am finished. On the cross, Jesus didn't say, I am finished now. My job is done. He just said, my work as reconciler between God and man, your job to believe in me is finished. Like, uh, my blood has been shed once and for all, for all sins, when somebody humbles themselves and confesses, admits that they need a Savior. So it is finished, not I am finished. We, David and I were joking about like, oh, Jesus knew when to get out of ministry. Three years and he was out. <laughs> <laughs> That's the joke. In reality, he continues to work. He continues to work on earth, working to build his kingdom. And it says in scripture that he intercedes on our behalf. If you've ever done intercession work in prayer, it is not a walk in the park to intercede. I mean, you can look down at humanity. You can look at your neighbor. You can look at your own family. And like Jesus is always working. He is never going to be done with us until heaven is on earth. So it is finished, not he is finished. So the finished work of the cross. Secondly, and this is, I love this one. How can we be sure that, that God is for us? He said so. God said it, and I'm going to believe it. 
What he said, I'm just going to believe it. Uh, Like other people can tell me stuff all day long, but I know what I know because of scripture, because of um, celebrating communion, like, like the scripture and the sacraments, like that is communion and baptism. Like God said, if you believe in Jesus, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, 1 John uh, chapter 5, it's just a little bit up from Revelation. 1 John chapter 5. Oh, this one you might win. 1 <laughs> John chapter 5, uh, verses 11 and 12. And this is what God has testified. God has testified this. God has said this. He has given us eternal life, and this life is where? In his Son. Whoever has the Son has what? And whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Whoever has the Son, that is Jesus, has life. God said so. So if Jesus has finished the work, and I admit it, and I believe it, God has said so, therefore, I am just going to stand on that. We cannot be dictated by our feelings in this manner. There are times it is so good to trust your gut, right? Dark neighborhood on your own, look alive, be aware of your surroundings, you know. Um, uh, different things like trust your gut instinct on things, like, like that's good. But when it comes to matters of faith, like you don't have to trust your gut. God said so, and so I'm going to believe it. I'm going to do the hard work of pushing in to it. Um, uh, Stott, John Stott said, feelings are an unreliable index to our true spiritual condition. You don't get a couple of nights sleep. What happens to yourself? Okay, I don't know how some people function on so little sleep. I'm like short of temper. I doubt everything. I'm crying myself. Like, oh, just everything is terrible. The same thing happens when I eat too much sugar. Right? There's something like correlation. So our feelings and our emotions... Uh, Women and men, you also need to mark like certain times of the day or certain times of the month or certain times of the year that, that it starts getting dark outside. And you're like, oh, seasonal depression started. But you have the word of God and you're like, I am not going to be governed by my feelings in this. I am going to surround myself with people who will, who will tell me the same thing that God is telling me. That I, I'm not governed by this. It is not a good marker of how well I'm doing as a Christian based on my feelings. Now, does the Holy Spirit use our feelings? Yeah, feelings of guilt or a little conviction, but that's not the only feelings that, that we have to, um, that we need to be trusting. Oh, he said, uh, our feelings go up and down like a seesaw, back and forth like a swing, ebb and flow of the tide. I start feeling a little seasick, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, uh, feelings are feelings, it's not fact. Now, you can, like I said, there's got to be a balance there. But are you immersed in Scripture in order to base your feelings on fact? Or are you just, like, thinking about Scripture every once in a while? Or are you, like, diving in? Something that I do, especially in seasons where I'm not spending a lot of time, like, getting to sit still and study, is I just have the Bible open to a chapter, and I just keep going back to the chapter. It's on my dresser. Every time I'm, like, I'm reading that, and I still haven't gotten past this chapter in Luke 10, you know, and I, I keep going back to it, keep going back to it. And that's good, because it's settling it in my heart. It's reminding me of things that I need in the midst of the storm's life, right? Christ is my firm foundation, but how we realize that is through Christian community, it's through celebrating communion, but it's mostly through his word in this leg of the stool that is God said so. The third thing is, is this, um, the Spirit of God. It is the internal and external witness of the Holy Spirit, which is the presence of God. Now, some of us might think presence of God, external evidence, and start thinking of Pentecostalism, right? Where you do not have God unless you are showing like shaking or falling down, like that happens, right? That it certainly has happened in situations I've been in, and you know, I'm like, okay, not a lot of weird stuff is going on, but I see external evidence. So a lot of us feel, and Stott was talking about this, the internal and external evidence of the Spirit of God is that we overemphasize this conviction of sin 
or overemphasize trying to see some physical manifestation. But there's also this gentle cleansing of the Holy Spirit as we just press in to him, into God and say, show me where, where I need to re be refined. Or, or you go through some hardship and you're like, oh, I see what God is teaching me here. We overemphasize certain things about the Spirit of God, but underemphasize other things. He said it um, specifically, the gentle work of cleaning our hearts, calming our fears, and countering our doubts. That is the gentle work of the Holy Spirit, always at work. That is the internal witness. I want to read two scriptures from Romans, so now we get to go even further forward in our Bible. Romans 5, and then we'll read in Romans 8. Um, so internal witness of the Holy Spirit. It says, um, the second part, it says, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. The internal witness of the Holy Spirit. We know how dearly God loves us. I'm a Christian because God loves me and wants to be in relationship with me, and I just said yes over and over and over again. It's not because I've earned it or deserve it, but it's just his great love for me. And because of his great love for me and my surrender, the Holy Spirit is now filling my heart with his love. The marker of, the internal marker of a Christian is you're just, your heart is filled with love. You look at somebody and you're just like, oh my goodness, I just love you so much. And I am not really like a really super demonstrative you know, person, but I look at some of your faces and I'm like, oh, I'm like, wow, God really loves you and I love you through the gift of the Holy Spirit that is within me. Because on my own, eh, you guys will get through it, it's fine. Like, toughen up, right? No, I, I do. And that's not me thinking, you know, that I'm so great at being empathetic or merciful. It's because of the love of God in my heart. The second one is in Romans 8. How can I be sure that the Holy Spirit is with me? The assurance of my faith. Romans 8, um, 15 and 16. Yeah, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Oh my goodness, how wonderful is that? The Holy Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm in us that, yes, I am a Christian because I am called by God and saved by grace, and I am God's child. The Holy Spirit partnering with our spirit. And then um, there is a prayer of alignment where we get ourselves in the way. And I wish I had a better picture for this. So God is over all things, and then man is given dominion over all things. Right? So God is like that covering, and then we have people, and then we have the stuff of life. But what often happens is that we get that alignment, we get all those things and that stuff in between us and God. And so God wants to partner his spirit with our spirit, but we have put so much other stuff in the way, our insecurities, our shame, our doubts, our fears. Like we put um, even like our jobs or our... Um, you know, how people think of us, oh, reputation is the word I was thinking of. We put all this other stuff in between God and ourselves. And so then we're just trying to figure out, like, how do I get to God through all of these other methods? But if God's Spirit is partnering with our spirit, here is the prayer. And I learned this years ago back when I was a teenager. It says, um, our prayer is, my spirit submit to my mind. My mind submit to the Spirit of God. You will take no other authority or no other um, instructions from any other spirit than the Holy Spirit of God. And it's this prayer of alignment. And so then you're saying, my body submit to my spirit, spirit submit to my mind, my, uh, body submit to my mind, mind to my spirit, spirit to the Spirit of God. I'll put it in the email tomorrow I'll, so I get it right. But it's this prayer of like, no, God, you're in charge of my spirit. And as our spirits partner together, I am filled up with you. Therefore, I am in charge and control of my thoughts. 
And our thoughts govern how we move around through the world. And then our thoughts also govern how we take care of our bodies. You only have the one body. And so what happens is, uh, for me, it's, you know, it's like junk food and sweets. I'm like, Rita, you got to quit eating like a 15-year-old boy. <laughs> it's taken me a while, and me and the Holy Spirit are still having it out. But it's body submit to my mind, mind submit to my spirit, spirit submit to the Spirit of God. You will take no other commands or authority from anyone else except for the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, so that's Romans 8, 15, and 16. How can you be sure that you're a Christian? You have this internal witness that you are no longer living for yourselves. You're totally surrendered and submitted to him. And then watch how God is going to work. And not just strong conviction of sin, but also the gentle work of cleansing you. Then we also have the external evidence. So we have the internal evidence, but like I said at the beginning, like if you have somebody that you care about and you never say it, then there's no external evidence. Anybody here ever have a crush on a boy who never found out? Or a girl and never found out? Just me and Sarah are the only honest ones in here. Yeah. Or a crush on a girl and she never found out, and then you're so heartbroken when she found somebody to fall in love with and become boyfriend or girlfriend because you never said anything. Right? The movies make it seem really fancy. It's probably a good thing that you didn't say anything. But there should be an external evidence about what the internal work of the Holy Spirit is. I was listening to a conversation um, between Rita Springer and Stephanie Gretzinger, YouTube. Did you see that one yet? It's, I'm about this far into it. Okay, here's our YouTube watch, and this is how far we are into it. But something that, Stephanie is a worship leader, and one of the things she said is a lot of people come to her confer, conferences and concerts because they want to eat the fruit of her ministry, right? The time that she has spent quiet and alone with God, filling up with him, being submitted to his Holy Spirit, singing, as she sings around the house, God gives her songs, she's ministering to her children and to her husband, and, and then she gets to minister in a public view, and people come in just to eat the fruit of her ministry, the external evidence. And she said, What's, what I would love is for people to come in and be inspired to seek after God in those quiet places, to do the work of submitting to God and surrendering body, soul, mind, and strength to His Holy Spirit, and then have the fruit of their lives be a reflection. So that the evidence of being a Christian, how can you be sure as you look around and you say, God, what is the fruit coming off of my life? You think about that for a minute. What is the fruit coming off of your life? You believe in Jesus. You, your, your sins are saved. You are founded in the Bible. God said so. But then you have this third thing, the Holy Spirit at work in your life internally and externally. And we see the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, increased joy, increased patience. Aha, uh -huh, Brian. He said, don't ever pray for patience. Increased patience, increased kindness, increased um, self-control, like increased mercy, increased um, compassion for people, increased pain for those that are in pain, increased love for those that need love of God. This is the external evidence of the fruit. Um, David and I love that we get to serve this church in our strengths, right? We love that. But if all you do is show up here, I'm going to be really careful I say this, show up here every Sunday and you just glean the fruit of, you know, Jason's guitar playing and Brian's piano playing and Jody's worship and Beth's worship and Sam's worship and David's worship and my teaching and then the fruit of the people that bring hospitality things and the fruit of the leaders that teach the kids. If that's the only, t that's the only fruit you get is from somebody else, What are we doing as Christians? You might be stopped up right now. There might be some root issues that you haven't dealt with. Uh, we have an apple tree, and I was like, oh, I moved this example to the end. I deleted it out of my notes, and I put in another thing. I'll use this later, but I'm like, no, I think this works. We have an apple tree. It started as a seed last year in the fall. And now it's like this tall. I almost brought it, but it looks terrible, so it's a very bad illustration. But it's growing, right? And then 60-degree weather, I'm like, you're big enough to go outside now, right? So we put them outside, and now it's getting cold, so I had to bring them back inside. Some of the leaves are turning brown. 
And I'm like, oh no, I've killed the apple tree. But maybe not, because what happens in the elements, what happens in the world is we have things that shrivel up and God says it's good because Jesus can come in and prune those off. The Holy Spirit can prune them off of us in order for us to be more fruitful. But that tree cannot stay in the greenhouse by itself in isolation and expect to bear fruit. It needs cross-pollination. Cross Pollination is not a word. Cross-pollination. It also needs the resistance of the wind and its branches. In drought, its roots will go deep into the ground, and in the spring with the rains, it will flourish and begin to bear fruit. But it can't do that in this isolated world of just our you know, kitchen counter, getting just enough sun to grow but not enough sun to bear fruit. That tree will never bear fruit in the safety of the house of God. You will never bear fruit in the safety of the house of God. You will come in here and glean the fruit of other people. You will have the best grapes and the, and the best fruit of the Spirit. You'll feel the most love. You'll feel the most joy and compassion here in this space. And you'll go out into that world and, and have nothing to show for it. At the end of all times, Jesus says he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. He's letting the wheat and the weeds grow up together. The wheat and the weeds. And at the end of days, when that harvest comes in, what fruit will you have? The wheat has the seeds on it, has the fruit of growth. But the weeds are nothing and they're going to be destroyed in fire. Don't come in here and just expect to eat fruit off of the ministry work that, that David and I and the teams do. And expect for your life to yield fruit that God is telling you you should be yielding. Your selfishness and your pride and the stuff that you've put up in between you and God is getting in the way. So this is going to cause a shift in how your perspective is. Because this afternoon when you go home, you're going to start to go to your old systems, your old habits. I'm going to turn on the game. I'm going to pick up social media. I'm going to go do something else that's just going to make me feel better. I'm going to eat that giant slice of cake to keep me awake and that big cup of coffee. And the Holy Spirit's going to reorder your priorities. When you go home today, my prayer is, is that you go home and fall on your knees and say, Lord, this week bear fruit in my life. Show me how to be filled up with your Holy Spirit. It is not a one-time moment that you can get on a Sunday morning eating the fruit of the worship and the Word. If that's all that this is, let's turn it, let's shut it down. Let's gather into little groups and homes and feel the hardship of what it is without people um, feeding into you and you have to feed yourself. Be around other people for that pollination. Be around other people, even in the world, the elements of the world. You need you need the hardship of the world because that will drive your roots down deep into the Word of God and into the peace of God and the strength of God. And it is not easy for you. It is hardship. I know. I know. It is hard, but God is saying He's going to bloom something new in your life. And it's going to be beautiful fruit. But what you have been trying to create fruit of your own, He's saying, I'm going to prune that off. I'm going to prune that off, and it's going to hurt a little bit, but it's going to be so much better in years to come. Trust the process of the pruning. Trust the process of the elements that are coming in your life, and you're like, I'm confused or I'm unsure about this. Can you be sure that you're a Christian? Yes, the finished work of Jesus. Yes, the Word of God, and yes, the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Okay, so um, next week, I just pray that you're pushing into this word for you today. Um, look at the ways that you are depending on other people to bear fruit in your life. We need to encourage each other. I heard so many encouraging things this past week, and I know it's because you're, the Holy Spirit's allowing some cross-pollination so that I can begin to bear even better fruit. But it's because of your testimony of the struggle, your testimony about being brave and to continue to do the good work in your life encourages the fruit in my life. That's why we need each other, right? Yes, okay. Church, we are going to... Um,
uh, dismiss with a pr quick prayer and announcements, but I want to spend some time in prayer up here at the front with a few people who need healing from different things or they have a loved one that needs healing. And so um, I'm going to ask if you want to stay in here and pray from your seats um, and then and pray with us, you can. But um, I, I just I feel the need this morning. I was like, hey, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need a couple of prayer shawls or blankets. Yep. Um, so I'm going to pray a quick prayer, uh, do the announcements just so we know what's going on in the life of the church, and then we're going to spend some time in prayer up here. So if you want to talk and visit, that's great, absolutely, um, but just go and do that out there in the lobby for us, okay? All right. Um, all right. Father God, I just thank you that we can be sure, we can be certain of the hope that we have in you and the new life that you have promised. We can be certain because you said so. Jesus completed it, and the Holy Spirit testifies. And so God, in the midst of just um, this thing that you are doing within our body, within our church, I just pray we would not keep it silent. We would not keep the good things or the hard things to ourselves so that we can encourage each other, but also help each other bear fruit that will glorify you and grow your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.